Can we start? Okay. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having me here. My name is Dimitrios. I'm uh, from Greece. You hear a few things about me. So I'm engaged in computer security since 2002. I was a member of one of the first reverse engineering groups back in Greece. And I started my career as a network security engineer. Then I jumped into developing for almost five years. In the last five to six years, I focus mainly on threat security. While uh, before I joined Microsoft's threat intelligence team as a senior security researcher, I was leading another team which was conducting malware reviews for the Google Play Store. Besides that, I'm a father of two, a boy and a girl. In my free time, I mostly write and play uh, music. So before we start, I would like to address a question which I get quite often during my talks. Can you guess this question? What? Sorry? No? <laughs> You're close, though. So let me help you. Yeah, so... The common question that I get is uh, how come a Microsoft security researcher talks about Android security and all this kind of stuff. So as I said before, I have been following up with development cybersecurity for quite a long time. And I can assure you, although I think that you also agree with me on the fact that uh, today's threats need a more, let's say, holistic approach. A breach in your mobile device might have much more security impact than you may think, and in some cases can even touch your corporate network. So I strongly believe that companies must evolve their security solutions in order to protect their clients across all platforms. So I'm very proud of being a part of such an initiative from Microsoft. And with that being said, let's jump right into the outline of this briefing, which consists of the following topics. So first of all, we're going to talk about the Android user interface, some basic concepts, definitions that I'm going to use during this briefing. And then we're going to discuss, we're going to show you some going confusion attacks. What is the story so far? What has been presented during the last years when it comes to the Android user interface? Then I'm going to demonstrate the behavior which so far was, let's say, unnoticed. And uh, this attack that I'm going to show you today, the universal overlays attack, was let's say, inspired from this specific behavior. Finally, we're going to see some defense and takeaways when it comes to GUI confusion attacks and to this specific one. So starting with the Android graphics architecture, I'm not sure how many of you have created an Android app so far, but we may all agree on the fact that one of the most important features of an Android app and any app is the ability to interact with the user. So almost every modern Development environment facilitates this process by providing the tools to make it easier. And with that being said, an Android developer with just a few clicks can add or remove web views, text views, buttons, you name it, without having to dive deep into their implementation details. Now, system-wise, when an app, an application is created, a window is going to be attached to it, which is a container for view objects that are backed up by surface objects. And since we may have more than one application running on Android device at the same time, the next component which comes into place is the surface flinger, which will gather all these surfaces and try to composite them onto display after talking with the hardware composer, a hardware abstraction layer that will gather all this info in order to do the final composition to display. What I intentionally didn't mention in my previous slide is the role of the window manager. So which component will decide the order of the windows, which one is fo gets the focus, and all this kind of stuff. And this is where the window manager comes into place, which will compile all the CIFO and send them to the surface flinger in order to do, as I said before, the final composition. Regarding the window manager, it is a system service, which despite the rich functionality uh, of it, third-party apps don't have access to their OA IDL but they can reach certain properties and certain functionality by using classes like the window, window manager, or the view configuration class. And here's an example of how we can obtain a window manager instance and get access to these certain properties and functionality. Another important aspect, which is related to what I'm going to talk about, is what we call Z order, and refers to uh, the order across an imaginary axis, which starts from the bottom of the screen, of a mobile screen, up to wh what the user sees on top of the screen. And uh, the position of a window in this imaginary axis depends on the type of the window. 
every Android app can request such a type. The technique is pretty much simple. Obtain a window manager instance, use the layout parameters class in order to request the specific type, and then use the add view method of the window manager in order to attach a view to the newly created window. Now a couple of things here. Windows that are on top of this imaginary axis uh, come with a high price. A request, for example, an app in order to be able to create such a window must have some specific permissions. And in the specific case, the system alert window permission. Now, what is interesting here is that before SDK 23, any app can request this permission and get it auto-approved by the system. But what is even more interesting is the fact that uh, even in the newest Android versions, when an app targets an SDK which is lower than 23, then gets this permission approved by default, default without the user getting notified about it. And this brings me to uh, the figure which I have here on your right, where you can see the various window types and their position across this imaginary axis that I talked to you about. And uh, despite the fact that many of these window types have been deprecated or aggregated under a single flag, they can still be used by apps which target low Android SDK versions. And what I mean by targeting an Android at a low SDK version is you, it's, it's a simple entry in your manifest file. You just add target SDK, and this is, this is it. You don't have to do something more sophisticated. All right, so uh, we talked about the look of a window. What about the behavior? And what I mean by behavior is how window, a window will react on various events which take place on an Android device. And the common case is that uh, the window will simply consume this event and do something, do some kind of an action, perform something, some functionality, for example. Uh, there is a way, though, to change this default behavior by using flags, like the one that I have here, which can render a window not touchable. This means that the window will simply dispatch the user's touch to the window which is exactly below this one here. Now there's a catch here that this window which, which uh, has the specific flag won't get notified for the window for the user's touch. And uh, another thing is that we don't need any kind of special permission in order to use this uh, specific flag. All right, finally, a very interesting property of these windows, which we'll call them floating windows, is the fact that it depends solely on the process that they belong to. So what this means is that even if you have created this window within an activity, and this activity exits for some reason, this window will still remain there, and this is an actual screenshot, as long as the process remains active, and the other way around. And this is how, uh, actually a property which uh, has been abused by many malware families, for, for example, from ransomware. They use these windows in order to cover the user interface of the device, so the user will simply lose access to the user interface, and this is just one case. All right, so let me now summarize what we have so far. I said that uh, Android is an operating system where more than one app can run at the same time in the background. Each time, though, only one app will be interacting with the user. This is the common, let's say, case. Uh, we have ways to identify, for example, the user, the developer of an app using digital signatures. And we can, let's say, uh, make sure that an app meets some specific criteria if we install this app from a trusted source, like the Google Play Store. Although, there is no explicit info showing to the user about the actual user interface and the application that it belongs to, which means that any app can imitate the user interface of another app and claim the identity of it, right? All right. And this brings me to our first main topic, which is the GUI confusion attacks, and starting by the obvious uh, attacks, which, let's say, uh, leverage some kind of tap jacking vulnerability or some kind of uh, vulnerability on some flags, which, uh, and the way they can be used, are, let's say, underestimated when they are compared with attacks which depend on, uh, let's say, some memory corruption buggers and so on. This is, though, a little bit unfair if you consider the fact that almost every modern malware campaign uses this type of uh, attacks in order to achieve their targets. Uh, Cerberus, uh, all, all these, let's say, modern phishing campaigns are using the specific type of attack. 
So we may uh, classify these uh, GUI confusion attacks in three main categories. The ones that they're using overlays, task hijacking, and activity switching. And I will start with the first one. So the overlays, the idea is to conceal a part or all of the message which is communicated to the user via some graf graphical user interface in order to alter this message and trick the user to take a decision that we we'll normally take. Imagine, for example, that we have a cyber criminal, a fraudster, which promises a, a service or a product, but requires for this product a large payment, so it will send uh, a, a request to the user's bank. The user's bank will send a push notification to the user's device or something. The user will see the amount and will simply reject the payment. Now, if the same request originates from an, from an APK which can create these overlays, then this amount can be simply concealed and the user may be tricked in order to approve the request. So from what I just described, you understand that an app, in order to be able to perform this attack, must be able to create windows which are on top of this imaginary axis that I showed you before. And one way to do such a thing is by using type toast windows. And this is why this attack is called toast overlay attack. So these uh, type toast windows have a very unique property. They are they have been created in order to be in, on the top of this imaginary axis because they want uh, to communicate an alert or some kind of a message to the user, and the user has to take some immediate decision. So this is something which this attack leverages, this property. So again, as I showed you before, we can use the window manager instance, the layout parameters, and just request this specific type, set the click-through capability, transparency, and of course, we can adjust the position of this window. This attack doesn't work anymore because uh, those windows up uh, since a specific Android version, I don't remember exactly which one, don't have a long lifetime, which means that this window will be shown for a very short amount of time to the user, so it won't work anymore. All right, this works though. And uh, this attack uses type system alert or type application overlay window. But the user has to navigate to this menu and approve uh, the system alert window permission for your app in order for you to be able to do such a thing. A less known attack, which was first found in the Flare 99 hardware, was this one here. So this uh, malware was creating a, was using a library. And it was giving a couple of values, which were found to be window types. The one is that the one uh, that I told you about, the type toast window, and the other one was the type presentation window, which was an overlooked, let's say, window type, which could create windows on top of this imaginary axis with no specific permission. So it was using these uh, uh, windows, window types, in order to create the window manager instance, as we saw before in the native code, and just uh, creates such a window if uh, the SDK version, depending on the SDK version, of course. Now, this uh, vulnerability was addressed by this CV here. Now, if you ask me how this uh, was used by this malware, so in Android, uh, since Android 10, an app can't start an activity from the background. There are exceptions to this rule. Uh, for example, an app that has some visible window can't start an activity from the background. This is just one exception. But... Um, Okay, so what? This, uh, let's say, start activity from the background was used by Adware in order to spam the user with advertisement, right? So out of the blue, these apps were starting a window which was showing some, some kind of a, uh, an advertisement or something. And, of course, when uh, this restriction came up, these, uh, uh, let's say, families were the most uh, affected by it. So this is exactly how this malware was using this uh, specific, uh, let's say, vulnerability. It was creating a window which was not visible to the user, but it was considering, considered as visible by the system, I guess, in order to use it as a foothold and start starting activities from the background and spam the user. That was the main idea, I guess. So the next attack is what we call task hijacking. And... Uh, when it comes to a task, when it comes to the Android operating system, and when it comes to Android user interface, a task has a slightly different meaning from the one that we, let's say, know. So a task is a set of activities that the user interacts with in order to do something. 
these tasks may belong, these activities actually may belong to different apps or different tasks. And uh, this attack leverages uh, uh, conditions which take place during a task state transition, like the task affinity or the allow task reparting, in order to inject a malicious activity within the specific task. The idea is, again, pretty much very simple. So create an activity, set the task affinity to the targeted app, and then use this specific flag in order to inject this activity to the user's activity, to the legitimate, let's say, activity. One attack which actually works and uh, pretty much popular, even now, abuses APIs which are used to start an activity from the background, like the start activity or the move task too. So the idea is simple. The malware will observe the foreground of the device, and if the app which is currently in the foreground is targeted, then it will start its own activity, which is identical to the one of the legitimate app in order to hijack uh, the user session. This is the main idea. There are restrictions, of course, to this, uh, let's say, attack. We can't see in the Android operating system right now, we don't know which app is running in the foreground. We can't start an activity from uh, the background, as I, show, as I told you before. But there are exceptions. The accessibility service, which can get your app opt out from any kind of uh, UA restriction. The user touch, which can be used with, with a small hack to uh, get the visibility of the window of the app, which is on top. Uh, we have the system alert window permission. And of course, we have the full screen intents, which can be used instead of a notification to send it uh, to start a full activity instead of a notification. And this is how it works. This is the first demo. Let me first make sure that it works. Yeah. So this uh, app here has just two permissions. And uh, in your, let's say, um, newest Android versions, for you won't get notified about these permissions. So let me show you again just to, uh, the user starts the legitimate app, and the malware identifies that the legitimate app is targeted, so it will simply switch and start its own activity. That's the main idea. All right, so now let me explain to you the behavior that I said before on which this attack, the attack that I'm going to describe today, uh, let's say, was inspired. So I said before that uh, an app can use the start activity to start an activity from, let's say, the background. This new activity can start another one. Now the question is how these activities are arranged on top of an Android screen. And then the answer is by using what we call a back stack. So imagine something like a last in first out stack where the user can simply add or remove activities from the top of the stack by interacting with the user interface. Now what is interesting here is that when an activity is pushed in this specific stack, it will retain its graphical user interface. What is even more interesting is the fact that, uh, let's say that the user starts another task, let's call it task B, then task A will go in the uh, background, but its back stack will remain intact, which means that when the user finishes with task B, then task A will get again in the foreground, and the back stack will be restored. Now, this may sound a little bit confusing, so let me give you an example. Uh, so we are creating a transparent activity here. In order to do that, we can just create a transparent theme, set the window to be transparent, set the background to be transparent. We don't want any shadowing or a title. Uh, window is floating means that the window it can be moved freely, it's not anchored. And uh, we set the background dim enabled to false in order to indicate that we don't want to blur the window which is below this one. Next, I use my, let's say, target YouTube app due to the fact that it has some motion and I wanted to see what happens in this back stack when I, I will cover this uh, window, YouTube wi uh, window with my transparent activity. And this is what happened. <laughs> I guess you, you can see the difference, but the idea is that you can't, you don't understand with which app you are interacting. That's the main idea behind it. So after, 
I thought was successful, and uh, I decided to do something a little bit more, let's say, uh, shady. Yeah. So let's say that you desperate want a YouTube uh, premium account. Would you click on this one? So as you understand, the idea here beside this behavior is that we can, let's say, uh, integrate the user interface of the activity which is on top with the activity which is below. But this is the main idea, and this is actually what, what is behind this specific behavior. Right. Okay, I guess we have something. We can integrate, as I said, the user interface of these two activities which are on the top of the back stack. But can we leverage the, uh, this, let's say, behavior in order to have some kind of an actual security impact? Not yet, because we have restrictions. We don't, we can't see which app is on top, as I said before. We can't start activities from the background due to the restrictions that uh, were imported in Android 10. And uh, we don't have yet click-through capability. So before I'm going to explain how I managed to leverage, actually to, yeah, to leverage what I have so, so far in order to get some kind of an actual security impact, let me explain my targets. So I was targeting uh, what we call important dialogues. And what I mean by that, I was targeting dialogues which request from the user to take an important decision. What this may be when it comes to third-party apps, I was after dialogues which request from the user to approve a payment or approve a remote login. When it comes to system apps, though, which is the most important in this case, I was start, uh, targeting dialogues which request from the user to approve a permission to the user's uh, SMS or uh, call logs. So these kinds of permissions or uh, access to some privileged service or system settings and so on. Now, we may classify these dialogues in two main categories, single-step decision dialogues. Simply said, the window will pop up, the user will click on it, and a decision will be made, will reject or approve uh, the request. Or multi-step decision dialogues where the user has to follow uh, some steps in order to get to a final UI and approve or reject a permission. So starting with the first one, which is the first line of defense of the Android operating system when it comes, comes to privacy, to your privacy. So permission dialogues, which control access to, uh, as I said before, call logs, SMS logs, contacts, or even devices like microphone, camera, and so on. Now, these dialogues before Android 11 belong to this package here. And uh, in Android 11, they move to an Apex, this, this Apex here. But they can be customized by OMs using runtime resource overlays. Now, the main idea is what kind of window these dialogues were using. And to my surprise, they were using a, a simple base application window, but they had a couple of interesting flags. And the most interesting is the second one, which is um, the high non system overlay windows. Let me tell, tell you some things about that. So uh, this flag can be used by system apps in order to protect dialogues from type toast or system alert window windows. And I said system apps because for an app to use this flag must have this permission here, which is signature privileged. So it can be used only by uh, system privileged apps, although this then moved to the hide overlay windows in Android 12, and now actually it can be used by any app. Anyway, if you think about it, what I showed you before regarding the transparent activity, it was a simple base application window, so it didn't use any kind of special window, so it won't get affected by this app. So the next step was to simply, uh, let's say, get click-through capability, and this was a bar simply simple, get the handle of the window that I want to, let's say, get this property, and set the flags, as I showed you before. And finally, add a couple of views here and there in order to cover the parts of the window that I was interested about. So this is uh, the result. And in your, let's say, uh, in your left side, you can see your, the permission dialog. In your right side, you can see the permissions overlay, how it looks. And this is how it looks in action. Give you some context. The app starts with zero permissions approved. Okay. 
Yeah, and ends up with all the permissions approved <laughs> without the user get notified about it. All right, so uh, that was the first, let's say, part. So I guess we already have something. Since with this uh, tag, we can get access to the user private team phone. We can get access to the camera, or we can get access to the microphone, I guess. But can we do something better? Can we get, can we escalate our uh, privileges? And the next, let's say, target was multi-step decision dialogues. I was after uh, dialogues which can approve access to the external director of the device, device admin API, display over other apps, notification access, premium SMS access, install and own apps, all these kind of uh, <laughs> powerful things. So uh, the main challenge here is to minimize the steps that the user has to take in order to approve your permission, right? So there is, though, a very convenient way to do that. So we can, let's say, create an intent, add an action which corresponds to the window that we want to open, and this will can be used, as, let's say, as a shortcut in order to do such a thing. But in the best case scenario, the user still has to take two steps. So in the first step, the user has to choose our app from a list of apps which request the same permission. And in the second step, the user has simply to click on this tangle button that you see there. Now, if you notice, the first list is alphabetically ordered, which means that by simply changing, modifying the name of our app, we can uh, predict where our app will end up in this specific list. And uh, the idea then was very much, let's say, similar to the one I showed you before. So in the first step, the malware will cover the rest of the apps, which, are, which request the same permission. And then we're using another activity, which we'll call trampoline activity. And we, you will understand why I, I named it like that, in order to cover the second step dialogue, the parts that we want. And this was the, what happened when it comes to, to this type of uh, windows, dialogues. Again, our app starts with uh, the display on top permission not approved. And then sub with the permission, the specific permission approved. I guess, uh, let's say that uh, some of you may observe some kind of a delay which when it comes to uh, changing these uh, views, but this can be adjusted. Actually, this was, in this case, it was, uh, we use a simple timer, but it can be simply adjusted and eliminate the specific delay. All right, so, uh, all right, so what we managed to get with this, let's say, attack when it comes to this type of dialogues. As you saw before, I managed to get all the dangerous permissions, file access, uh, device admin access to the device admin API, display over other apps, modify system settings, install unknown apps, and get usage access. And as you understand, with all these permissions and all these privileges, now we can do whatever we want in, in an Android device. Which, uh, let's say, dialogues were not vulnerable, the accessibility service dialog, and the notification access. And when I say to the notification access is uh, these notifications that they are shown in your device, so an app could get access to these notifications and uh, read, be able to read them. All right, so let me get in some details on how this, let's say, effect was created. So starting with the main activity, we are uh, creating an intent which will start the display on top access menu, at just the first instance. Then we're starting another activity, which we'll call trampoline activity, to start a second instance of the display on top access menu. Anyone can guess why we're starting two instances of the same activity? I got you sleeping. So, uh, no, the, the, the idea is, as I told you before, when, uh, since we have click-through capability, we won't get notified that the user clicked on our, uh, on our, let's say, uh, activity, on our view. So what we do in order to understand that the user just clicked. So when the user clicks on the display on top access menu, the first instance, our app will go on pause state. So we understand that the user simply clicked. So then we can just create another activity, which we'll call trampoline activity, that will cover the first part of the, this dialogue. 
Then we go again on pause since the user clicks. And then we just start the second, uh, let's say, overlay in order to cover the second step uh, dialog. And then finally, we can simply redirect the user to another activity or out to another app. Uh, what I didn't cover so far is how we get the step, the actual step that we are currently in. I mean, the first step or the second step and so on. And this, this is pretty much uh, trivial. We can create an intent. And uh, depending on this, uh, let's say, extra info that carries with, we can get the actual step, right? The first step or the second step. So this is the idea. Get the step that we are currently in. Create a window manager instance. Uh, cover the parts of the screen that we are interested about when it comes to the first step. Then when we go in on post state, we modify the activity, I mean, the, the views. And finally, we cover the second part of the screen. This is uh, the idea behind this attack when it comes to multi-step dialogues. All right, so let me now summarize when it comes to uh, the overlay attacks, the universal overlay attacks. So the basic idea is that the user can't identify the app that they're currently interact with, right? There's no indication to show to the user with which app you're interacting. The user can just identify the user interface that interacts with. And uh, we talked about um, uh, the backstack, and we said that when an activity is pushed in this backstack, it will retain its graphical user interface, which is pretty much crucial for this attack. Uh, since we can integrate the user interface of the activities with, which are on top, the the one with uh, the two the two activities which are on top. Finally, by adding click-through capability, as I show you, we can. Uh, Click, I mean, hijack the user's click and uh, send it to where we exactly we want. Finally, using this attack, we can hijack single-step decision dialogues, multi-step decision dialogues, and any kind of third-party app. All right, so how we can protect Android apps from these or even similar type of attacks? And this code that you see here was uh, adapted from uh, the OSP and the dialogues which were not vulnerable to this attack. So when an event, a, a touch event is created, it carries some info with it. And uh, this info can be used in order to identify that our window is not, let's say, um, obscured or partially obscured by another one. And this is actually the flag. So by using this flag, we can simply identify if our window is obscured. And we can simply then consume the event and reject it. Don't do anything. And this is how exactly was mitigated this issue. Now, when it comes to Android 12 and after, we have the hide overlay windows uh, permission, which can allow, to use, uh, can allow you to use the specific uh, API method. Although this won't protect you from this specific attack, but it will protect you from type toast or system alert window uh, windows. All right. And uh, with that, I will be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you very much. I will talk about cars today. Actually, where is Android Auto in the cars and where are payment confirmations uh, from the car for now? So does the similar technique is possible to implement to overlay payment confirmations in the car or other actions like subscriptions to the services, uh, opening some URLs, wherever in the cars? A anything. If the if your window, which uh, holds this type of information, has, has some kind of a control, is not protected by these flags, it can't be overlaid by any app. Yeah, but this by this specific attack. Yeah, thanks. More questions? No. Thank you. Seems not. Thank you, Dimitrios. Thank you.